Disrupting Japan, Episode 38. Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening. Most of us startup founders have it relatively easy. We choose our battles, and we usually choose to compete where we can sell to businesses and customers directly, and where our speed, agility, and innovation is recognized and appreciated by the market. Yuya Nakamura didn't really have that option. And even if he knew in advance what he was getting into, he would have done it again. You see, when he left Tokyo University, Yuya founded a satellite company, hoping to compete in one of the most controlled, closed industries on the planet. And amazingly, they're already seeing success. Having launched the world's first commercial microsatellite several years ago, they now have much bigger plans for their very small satellites. Now, during our discussion, Yuya and I talk about Tokyo University, also known as Todai. Now, people often say that Todai is Japan's Harvard or Oxford, but it's much more than that. Over 75% of all top-level bureaucrats are Todai graduates, and so are a large percentage of the C-level executives of public firms. Over half of Japan's Supreme Court graduated from Todai. Perhaps more than anything else, Todai represents the status quo in Japan. It is the gateway to the traditional power structure, and that makes the entrepreneurial changes we are seeing there even more surprising. But for now, we're here to talk about satellites. So let's get right to the interview. Ready to get started? Yeah. Okay, well, cheers. cheers. <laughs> I'm sitting here with Yuya Nakamura, who founded Axel Space to develop microsatellites. Yeah. Before we get into this, why don't you just tell us a bit about Axel Space and tell us what a microsatellite is? Microsatellite is. Um, artificial satellite weighing less than 100 kilograms and it's very small compared to the conventional satellite. It weighs like uh, several tons or something like that. The cost of the traditional satellite is like hundreds of millions of dollars and our satellite is you know, uh, inexpensive, just 1% of the traditional ones. So it's, it's cheaper to produce, and if, it's, if it weighs 10%, mm -hmm. it's obviously it costs about a tenth to launch as mm -hmm. well, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So actually, it was too expensive for private companies to have their own satellites, but now we have realized the microsatellite at, uh, let's say, several million dollars. Now it's something affordable for even the private sectors. What would it cost before and now? And I know the cost of a satellite is one of those. <laughs> it's like asking how much a car costs. Right? Yeah. With a traditional satellite mm. and with a, a microsatellite, what mm. sort of costs are involved? In the case of uh, conventional satellites, it takes three to six hundreds of hundred million dollars. And so 300 million to 600 million dollars. Yeah, and okay. to launch it, you need a, another hundred million dollars. Okay. <laughs> so it's so costly. Right. This is why <laughs> private industry doesn't do it. <laughs> and with a microsatellite? You need uh, three to five billion dollars, and you need another one million dollars to launch. So it's, it's one percent the cost yes. of traditional satellites. Yes. That is going to change the game. I think so. Now, you and Axel Space launched the world's first commercial microsatellite back in November of 2013, right? Mm -hmm. And it was to monitor Arctic sea ice. Now, that was five years after you started the company. Yeah. What happened between the founding and the launch? How did you get there? Actually, at first, I thought I was able to be found many customers about satellites, mm -hmm. and, but it was not. Actually, we found a partner uh, Weather News uh, to start a project, joint project about monitoring the Arctic Sea with their own satellite. Oh. Then uh, we started their project, uh, their satellite, and we started uh, looking for appropriate launcher, I mean the launch vehicle. But commercial microsatellite was our first attempt 
you know, right. <laughs> all over the world. So we didn't know how to do that. And the launch service provider were also confused about that. Actually, they launched many university satellites, which is for educational satellites. So what was the, ch the challenge? It was just the payload was too small? Um, it's not the biggest challenge, but they have some difficulties about pricing. So we uh, continued negotiation with them so long time, more than two years or something. And actually, I um, was about to uh, reach an agreement with the Indian rocket, huh. but um, they stopped negotiation. So <laughs> after, after two, two years. years, so we needed to find another one, and we started negotiation with the Russian. Uh, we agreed the launch of satellite in 2012. However, postponed that launch to the next year. It's a very. It sounds like a very different experience than <laughs> what most startups go yes. through. Things are moving very slowly. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure by aerospace standards, you guys are moving at incredible speeds. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that you were hoping to sell many satellites. Yeah. And you ended up working in partnership. Mm -hmm. How much of the engineering work and the components that go into building a satellite can be reused in another satellite? Actually, many of the conventional satellites uses the standard products that can be used in a different satellite. But okay. in our case, our satellite is very small like this. Yes. It's just in the half size of the model. Well, that's but okay. I mean, it's, it's an audio podcast, so <laughs> the audience doesn't know that. So the full size, it's about 80 centimeters? Smaller, it's around uh, uh, 50 centimeters. About 50 centimeters yeah. on the side. Mm. It's very small. So uh, we reuse the design, and um, our technology comes from university. Right. At the university, we had no money. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I myself started the satellite development while I was a university student. My satellite was so tiny, I mean, 10 centimeters on the side. Mass is just one kilogram. It's so small and it's difficult to implement every, you know, a functions of the satellite into. I imagine. Such a, <laughs> from the beginning of our my experience, it was so difficult to make a standard product. So we reuse only the way of developing the satellite and the basic design. The know-how and the basic platform is reusable, but mm. the components have to be customized for every single customer? Right. So mm. if the, the traditional satellite makers, I mean, they've got the engineering know-how, they have parts that they're reusing. And generally, mm. having a design constraint saying you need to make things small yeah. tends to be expensive. Mm -hmm. So why are your satellites 1% the cost of the traditional ones? Where does the savings come from? It's a very important uh, question. It's very difficult to answer. This is, you know, disrupting technology. <laughs> Actually, the culture is completely different oh, okay. about so it, toward the way of you know, developing so satellites. So in a sense, your advantage is not so much the raw technology, but the mm. fast pace that you can move. Absolutely. Actually, the important point is that huh. we have not improved the traditional satellite to a microsatellite. A microsatellite evolved from much smaller satellite. So it's a completely different technology base. Yes, they are base. two different products. All right, I see. And actually, traditional satellites are made by space agencies like JAXA, NASA, or uh, traditional big companies uh, in Japan, Mitsubishi, Electric, or NAC, or in the U.S., Boeing, or Rocket Martin, or something like that. So they are based on the traditional attitude toward quality. That makes sense. So they're in an environment where they're trying to avoid failure. Yes. They're not trying to innovate. Actually, they are using space-rated parts for all of the components inside the satellite. We are using industry-grade or um, automotive-grade. Not over-engineering. Right, you're yeah. right. Um, delivery time is very short. And of course, the cost is very cheap. Actually, the most difficult point to use space-rated product is its delivery time. It takes more than half a half year to get just, to source just one the parts. part, yes. Well, I mean, this certainly sounds like disruptive technology, yeah. doesn't it? That you mentioned before that you did research on microsatellites back when you were studying at the University of Tokyo. 
and in fact, your, your whole team, your engineering team, was from, from Todai. Did, did you guys work together at university, or did you meet up afterwards? How did, you, how did the team come together? Mm. Actually, uh, when I was a university student, there were two universities that were developing microsatellites. Uh, we called nanosatellites but because it's cheaper than microsatellites. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and in Japan, a University of Tokyo and Tokyo Institute of Technology developed their own satellites in parallel. Oh. And we were friends, but rivals, and we had a meeting so frequently to exchange some information about their uh, project status. That's why we could uh, keep high motivation Right, okay. <laughs> After the graduation, two engineers from the University of Tokyo and one engineer from the Tokyo Institute of Technology joined together to make this company. Oh, all right. Yeah. Tokyo University, hmm. most graduates, their goal is to go into a fast track government job or to get a job at one of Japan's major corporations. But I've got to say, in the last three or four years, mm. I've seen a lot of technology startup founders coming from Todai. What's changing there? Is the mm. attitude of the students changing? Is the university doing something to encourage people to start companies? The university is uh, providing some education for entrepreneurs. But the more important thing is that they can see many entrepreneurs from, from the University of Tokyo. It's track record or the fact that their friend is starting their company is I, important. I think so, yeah. Mm. I think that that is really new in Japan because before, when you looked at successful businessmen like Son-san or, or Mikitani, mm -hmm. they seem like almost bigger than life. You, you can't compare yourself to them. Mm. But I guess when you see your friends or people who are just a few years older than you, going out and starting a business, you start believing that you can too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So did you, did you consider taking a, a job at Mitsubishi? Or <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I was really thrilled about the microsatellite technology. Mm. I checked all the companies that are developing nanosatellites or microsatellites, but there weren't any. Well, I guess that goes back to what you're saying. It's the mm. industry is focused on no risk, don't worry about the cost. You know, the, yes, mm. they were only doing uh, work for the government. So I don't think it's a you know, healthy industry. In the US, I, can, I could find uh, some companies developing satellite components for nanosatellites, but it's for educational satellites. There uh -huh. were no commercial microsatellites. I need to make a commercial microsatellite, but there was no choice. Mitsubishi and NEC were developing a huge satellite, and even if I enter that company, I can't do. So the only way to continue working on microsatellites was to start your own company. Yes. <laughs> that makes sense. Mm. You mentioned before that you received some assistance from the government in grants and in setting up Axel Space. Actually, the government was supporting universities to, to help make uh, startups based mm -hmm. on the university technology. Our microsatellite was one of those, but most of the university technology were biology or chemistry. So the, it was a government program working with the university to promote university technology. Yes. Well, this is one thing that I think that Japanese universities are only starting to do. American universities are very good at making money from the technology <laughs> developed there. Yes. And encouraging the students to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. Pan has always been very bad at that. And it sounds like this is one of the very first attempts to monetize work done at the university. Yes, but the way the university supports the startup company was not good at that time because they are just paying money for it. Some basic seed funding and that's all. That's all. Of course, the money is very important, but they need other things to, to make a startup. Sure, you're just students. <laughs> yeah, just students. They need to learn the management yeah. of the company. You have picked one of the hardest markets to disrupt, <laughs> I think. Aerospace is not usually something that startups go running into. Mm. You ran up against your own uh, limitations on the business side pretty quick, right? Because mm. you, know, you were saying nobody took your, your, your CubeSats and your, <laughs> your microsatellites seriously at all at first. Yeah. Mm. Um, I swear that that was 
too early for us to start this type of business. And I visited many companies about、uh, the satellite project. So how do you do that? How do you sell a satellite? So I, <laughs> at first, I did、uh, visit some companies, like a toy company, a mapping company, and talked about our satellites.、Huh. But it does, it didn't work. Too too big of a jump, I guess. They get interest in our, you know, satellite at first. In 30 minutes, they、uh, stop thinking because. They cannot imagine how they can use our satellites. It would probably be very easy to get lots of meetings because it's such a fascinating topic. But actually, getting internal approval for a company to launch a satellite is、mm. something. You know, the Japanese companies, you know, structure. <laughs>、oh, yes. There are a lot of hierarchies. <laughs> so if we if we talked with some you know person in the company, even if he is thrilled about this project. He needs to persuade their boss, and their boss needs to persuade their boss. So, you know, yeah, this is a project、so、that, will,、yeah. that will die in committee for sure. <laughs>、uh, so, so it was difficult for us to to get a new customer for five years. But the environment is getting closer to us. More and more people have interest in this new business well, using space. How do you think this is going to change it if launching a satellite using、mm. this new technology?、Mm. So, so you're talking about three to five million dollars to、yeah. launch a satellite.、Mm. That opens it up to a whole new range of applications. Yes. So, how do you think the use of satellites is going to change in the next ten years? We raised fifteen point eight million dollars、uh, last month、mm -hmm. to launch three satellites in 2017. It's for Earth monitoring. We want to make it 50 satellite constellation by 2022, and by this infrastructure. We can monitor everything on Earth on a daily basis, and it's a completely new、uh, infrastructure. You would basically have a real-time Google Maps. Yes, it's similar, very similar. And the important point is that you know we're providing a huge amount of data, and now big data or artificial、uh, intelligence is improving, and it's very、uh, suitable for analyzing our big data. It's a lot of data coming in, but、mm. what what's the resolution of the target? Is two point five meters? Two point five meters. Okay, so that's enough to track ships at sea. Yes. That's what sort of applications? How do you think this data will be put to good use? We are now thinking of agriculture, forestry. Okay. And natural resources and business intelligence. We can monitor the amount of trade every day. Then we can estimate the economical figures. Sure, you could you could see how much how much freight is moving in and out of every port in the world. Yeah, yeah.、Mm. You were mentioning before there's a lot of American companies working、mm. in satellite tech.、Yeah. Mm. Is this a global market, or is this a kind of each country has its own strategic satellite mm. industry? Mm. It's a、um, global market by nature、mm. because satellites are orbiting. And well, with <laughs> with just you know one satellite, we can monitor everywhere on Earth. So we should、uh, go global when we do business in this you know a satellite、That、market. That makes sense. Yeah, on、mm. the commercial side, of course, it's、mm. it's the very definition of global, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, so what what is happening in aerospace now? There, there there's something amazing that's just starting to happen. I mean, last month Japan. Executed its first commercial satellite launch.、Mm. Um, mm. In America, America SpaceX is now working with NASA、mm -hmm. to send astronauts up to the the International <clears throat> Space Station. Blue Origin just landed、yep. a suborbital Shepard rocket back on its own platform. Yeah. <laughs>、um, mm. A few months back, ESA soft landed a probe on a freaking comet. Yeah. It just seems that okay, like.、Um, The space shuttle、mm -hmm. was first launched in like what 1980,、mm. something like space that. Space yes. Yeah, and then there was this long stretch of incremental improvements,、mm. and、yeah. it just seems like in the last year or two, there's this tremendous amount of innovation.、Mm. What's happening? What's driving this change?、Um, I think the this industry is moving forward to the next phase. At first. The government orders the private sector, and the private sector makes something for the government. Right. 
that was the first you know, age of、uh, space industry. Now, the private sector tried to use space by themselves. So that's why、uh, we're speeding up to make an innovative th-、uh, thing. And we're making that product in a year or something like that. So it's the governments have just taken a hands off approach. Yeah. And the technologies. I think so. Okay.、Mm. But I, I don't imagine the governments are too hands off because mm, if you've mm, got mm. global coverage with 2.5 meter resolution,、mm. that allows you to see a whole lot of things that a lot of governments don't want you to see. <laughs>、mm. So, what is the plan? How are you going to be dealing with? With that,、uh, yes, it's a very sensitive point.、Yeah. But the government don't, you know, doesn't want us to look at military base、right. or other sensitive places. But their limitation about the ground resolution is is around one meters. But in our case, the ground resolution is about two point five meters. So there is no problem about that. Really, and is that a globally agreed upon standard? There is no standard, <laughs> but. Most of the countries care about、uh, one meter or better resolution images. All right.、Mm. So that's why we're choosing 2.5 meters. That's not technological limitation. Ah, okay. So it's a it's strictly a business decision rather、yes. than a technological one. What we want to do is to cover the whole globe with our 50 satellites. The most of the U.S.、Uh, satellite company is focusing on the better resolution with small satellites. Our strategy is slightly different. That、But it's im- what's important is that with 2.5 meters resolution, we can、uh, detect cars on the road.、Mm-hmm. We want to analyze the city area, urban area as well, not only the, the farmland or forest. Are you going to continue to launch、uh, and develop satellites for other companies?、Uh, yes, I think it's important function because we want to keep our technology at high level. By possessing that satellite developing functions, we can be more flexible about the needs from the market. On a personal level,、mm. so you had to move from being a almost a lifetime engineer into being CEO very quickly. Yeah. So in that transition, what did you have to learn? What was the hardest thing to learn? And What did you have to change about yourself to become a good CEO?、Uh, as you said, I was originally engineer, but at the same time, I had some interest in、uh, managing the team. Okay. So、uh, that's why I tried to become a CEO when establishing a company. After that, I found a lot of difficulties about managing the company. Yeah, what kind of stuff? When we were developing the first microsatellite with just three engineers, there were no problem, but the num- number of engineers was increasing. And when we have seven to eight engineers, I noticed that I need to care about them. Yeah, you know, our employees. You know, actually, I like to talk with customers. It's much easier. I'm talking with employees because they are always with me,、uh-huh. and they're thinking about you know our company you know every day. So they have a lot of ideas, and I need to ask about that. I need to have them talk about that. And the more people there are, the harder that is. Yeah, yeah. I believe so. You know, I don't have MBA, and so I don't have the strategic you know. The theory about managing the company. Actually, that that probably works in your advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an engineer myself,、huh? and I've started four companies. And、mm-hmm. almost every engineer I talk with, they say the hardest thing they had to learn was the the people skills. Yeah. Right. How to deal with twenty people who need your attention all the time. <laughs> yes. So, when you talk with your friends back from the University of Tokyo.、Mm-hmm. I'm sure the majority of them did go on to take the really good jobs and in government and and industry. Do they think you're crazy for what you're doing? Do they understand <laughs> what you're doing? Maybe half of the half of my friends are very supportive, but the rest of the my friends think I'm crazy. <laughs>、mm. You talked before about role models. So when you were younger in high school or even in college. Who are your role models? Who who inspired you? 
actually, uh, I didn't have such kind of a mo role model. Really? That's why, you know, I decided to make a startup company at the, you know, the very end of my decision. As a last choice? Yes, that was <laughs> the last choice. Actually, I haven't imagined establishing my own company. Now, the university has, um, you know, education for entrepreneurs, but uh, there weren't any when I was a student. You know, I had no idea about establishing a company. I was just thinking of which company would make, make me develop a small satellite or something like that, but I realized it's difficult. So without the fund for a startup company from the university, I don't think I would imagine making a uh, you know, company. Well, listen, the U.S. has dominated the aerospace industry since, mm. well, mm. since the Wright brothers, really with recent advances by uh, Mitsubishi, Honda, and of course, Axel Space, do you think Japan will be able to become a global player in the aerospace industry? It's difficult for Japan to win in every uh, field of the space, but if we focus on some part, like Microsoft Lights or private jet or something like that, right. it's possible for us to win. Other than obviously microsatellites, what do you think that the Japanese aerospace industry has the best chance at becoming a global player in? Mm. I think mm, they should give up the support, full support from the government. <laughs> and that's the only way to win in the global market because they are so accustomed to getting funds from the government. So they didn't take risks. Again, it goes doing back business. to that same problem you talked about before. Yeah and why satellites cost 100 times more than they have to. Yes. So actually, the Honda is uh, doing business by themselves. They don't get any you know, subsidies from the government, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's why they're focusing on business, and they are selling many private jets in the U.S. But the Mitsubishi, they are getting so you know, much money from the government to develop even MRJ. I understand that it's very difficult to, to develop by themselves. It's a you know, huge project. But with the government fund, they're... Mm, you think mm. they'll rely on the government money rather than relying on innovation mm. to yeah. move the company forward? Right. Your money is on independent companies like Honda and Axel Space <laughs> to, to move yeah. forward in aerospace. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well. The government clearly has a role to play yes. in both yes. promoting aerospace mm. and promoting startups. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you think the government should be doing? In the case of microsatellites, I want them to become a client. Uh, what they were doing just give us some money to develop a satellite. But the satellite is useless because we don't have a customer just developing a satellite. It's meaningless. So You'd rather them give you a project. <laughs> or let you bid on a project. Mm. Actually, we, what we need is not the money. We, we want a customer. And it's very important for us to have a, a government customer because they're improving our credibility. Right. You know, if the government use, is using our products, other companies in the private sector, very easy to, uh, to buy our products as well. So it's very important for them to show that we are supporting this company or this industry. Right. Mm. Now, the Japanese government launches a fair number of satellites. Mm -hmm. Is Axel Space able to bid on those jobs, or do they go straight out to Mitsubishi and, mm. and the big companies? Currently, the Japanese government is planning to make large satellites only, because they need to give jobs for Mitsubishi and NEC. Ah. In turn, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, I think they need to change the strategy. They need to define what they want. Right. Not supporting the company. <laughs> I think that's the only way for the private sector to cut the cost and shorten the delivery time and to win the customer yeah. in the real market. I think that's the key. Like you say, there has to be a real market for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. This has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we're back. 
It's kind of amazing that Yuya's first approach was a small step above door-to-door satellite sales, but they seem well on their way now. And it'll be interesting to see that if their bet on the commercial sector rather than the government sector will pay off, and whether their decision to go with a 2.5-meter resolution will enable them to achieve widespread adoption without governmental interference. But you know, one of the most optimistic points that Yuya made was that we really do seem to be at the beginning of a huge leap forward in aerospace worldwide. Whether it's the result of governments being more hands-off or the technology finally becoming affordable enough for commercial companies to innovate on, it's debatable. But there's no question that something big is starting to happen here. Hopefully these advances will force governments to rethink the way they develop satellites and to let the little guys actually compete in the market. If you have a passion about satellite or space technology, come on by disruptingjapan.com slash show 038 and tell us about it. Or drop by the Disrupting Japan Facebook page. We'd love to hear from you. And when you drop by the site, you'll see all the links and sites that you and I talked about and much, much more in the resources section of the post. And if you get a chance, please leave us an honest review on iTunes. It's really the best way you can support the show and help us get the word out. But most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.